Greetings to all. Um, thank you so much for joining the CIL E Academy Distinguished Speakers Series in Public International Law. And today we are extremely honored and pleased to have as our distinguished speaker, Ambassador Dr. Nabir, Namira Nabin Negem. Um, we have her biography on our website, but may I highlight a few of her many accomplishments? Uh, she is currently, let me just see. She is currently the legal counsel and director of the Department of Legal Affairs of the African Union since 2017. And may I add that she made history as the first female legal counsel of the African Union, which represents some 55 African states. She also served as ambassador of Egypt to Rwanda, and she has served as legal advisor and counterterrorism expert to the Egyptian mission at the United Nations. Uh, Ambassador Negem is really a very seasoned diplomat and also a renowned international law expert with a breadth of knowledge of different areas of international law. Indeed, I first met Ambassador Negem a few years ago at a conference in Luxembourg on illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing but she also has expertise in terror, and uh, I believe she's written on the transfer of nuclear technology and much more. And today she will speak to us on an issue that has much global relevance, including for this region, and that is on the unconstitutional changes of government from theory to practice, the correlation between the UN Charter and the African Union Constitutive Act. Uh, Ambassador Negem, it's my great pleasure to welcome you and uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor, and good day to everybody. Of course, now we can all say morning and evening. We don't know who's joining us from where. Um, at the outset, I would like, of course, uh, to thank the organizers for inviting me today, and uh, especially Professor uh, Oral, uh, the director of the center, and also Professor Patricia for being with us today. Uh, without further ado, let me start by defining the unconstitutional change of government. It's the simple fact of grabbing governmental power through means other than what is mentioned in the constitution of a country. The, I would refer to the unconstitutional change of government as UCG. Uh, UCG does not necessarily create chaos in a country, and violence is not a factor in determining whether it had occurred or not in the African Union context. This is relevant when we are going to analyze the correlation between the UN and AU while dealing with UCG. As you know, the organization of the African unity was established in 1965 and it was inherited by the African Union in 2002. The UN preamble similar to Article 3 of the OAU Charter, clarified that the sovereign equality of all member states, non-interference in the internal affairs of states and respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity are among the key principles of both organizations. This is similar to what we have now in the Constitutive Act. It's like we still have the same principles there. Yet, under the UN Charter uh, in Chapter 8, it allows intervention in certain cases, but this was not permitted under OAU Charter. So the intervention is allowed in the UN Charter, Chapter 7. It is allowed now, as you will see, in the AU Constitutive Act, but it was not allowed and permitted under the OAU Charter. Why and how did we move from complete non-intervention to escalation to the intervention. As of the 1960s onwards, the common way of change of government was through coup d'etat in Africa. We witnessed more than 200 successful and failed coups between 60s and 90s, and sometimes leading to escalations in the security situation internally. 
mostly up to 1997, the OEU was mostly silent in these situations, which it, like, why I'm mentioning 1997, because this is the turning point that constituted a significant departure from complete non-interference to condemnation and then led to the adoption of a policy framework on unconstitutional change of government. So what happened in 1997? While OEU summit was sitting in session, a coup took place in Sierra Leone against a democratically elected government. Consequently, the African heads of states and government issued the declaration to condemn for the first time the unconstitutional change of government. Later, in the 1999 summit, the OAU has adopted a position that considered UCG to be unlawful. It requested those who took over power through UCG to leg legalize and legitimize their situation and report the outcome of their efforts to the 2000 summit. In July 2000, the assembly decided to adopt a framework to institutionalize the OAU response to UCG. We call it the Lomi Declaration. The declaration considered the following situations as UCG, a military coup d'etat, intervention by mercenaries to replace a democratically elected government, replacement of a democratically elected government by armed dissident groups and rebel movements, and the refusal by an incumbent government to relinquish power to the winning side after free, fair, and regular elections. Moreover, it decided to impose the following sanctions on governments that unlawfully ascended to power. Condemnation and denial of recognition, suspension from OEU activities, request to restore the constitutional order within a maximum of six months. And upon the lapse of these six months, with no satisfactory developments or progress, further sanctions may be imposed. This include inter alia trade restrictions, visa denials, um, restrictions of government uh, to government contacts. So this is the real shift that took place. And why I'm mentioning this declaration, because it is the basis of what we are having now in the AU Constitutive Act and the Peace and Security Protocol. In 2002, this declaration became, as I'm saying, the basis for Article 4 of the Constitutive Act, which stipulated the following. The union shall function in accordance with the following principles in paragraph P, condemnation and rejection of unconstitutional changes of governments. Moreover, in 2004, the protocol establishing the AU peace and security empowered it to impose sanctions in cases of UCG as per the criteria provided in the Lomi Declaration, including the suspension from the participation in the activities of the union, via the Article 30 of the Constitutive Act. Further, if the situation escalates and leads to deterioration in the situation of peace and security in the country, Article 4 H of the Constitutive Act may be initiated, which provides the AU the permission to intervene in its member states. Let me be very clear here that the unconstitutional change of government within the AU system is considered as such threatening peace and security. It doesn't need to be like the power to be grabbed through uh, military intervention or only the mercenaries. It can go smooth, the action itself, to take uh, power unconstitutionally, but we still have issues with it and we consider it a problem to the maintenance of peace and security. So now, as you can see, both the UN Charter and AU Constitutive Act allow interventions, but the situations do differ when to intervene. Although both allow the interventions, if the situation constitutes a threat to the maintenance of peace and security, yet the scope is different as the UN doesn't permit interventions 
in situations of unconstitutional change of government unless it threatens the peace and security. But the AU allows it, and to, based on the facts of the occurrence of the UCG, and whether to constitute a threat or not, whether it will lead to genocide or crimes against humanity and so on, then they can decide to intervene militarily. For the, OA, for the AU, over the years, it has developed a normative approach on how to deal with UCG, and it is taken in stages. Stage one is to classify the situation as a, an UCG. That's the beginning that we have to identify if the situation constitutes um, unconstitutional change of government or not. Once this fact is established, the peace and security starts with the condemnation and providing an ultimatum. The ultimatum differs per situation, but the maximum is the six months in order to restore the constitutionality. For instance, when an unconstitutional change of government took place in Togo on 5 February 2005, the Peace and Security Council met the following day, which means 6 February, and issued a communique condemning the UCG and called for a speedy return to constitutional order. It also demanded that the power be handed over to the constitutionally elected government. In another example, when the military in Sudan ousted former President al-Bashir on 11 April 2019, the council issued a communique on 15 April 2019 condemning the UCG and called on the military to hand over power to a civilian transitional government. This is a very important example because the AU played a big role in what took place in Sudan. Stage two, during the period provided to return to constitutional order, the AU intensifies diplomatic efforts in order to help the parties concerned reach an amicable solution. Again, in the case of the Sudan, AU Commission Chairperson appointed the special envoy to mediate between the military and civilian groups in order to establish a transitional government. While the political mediation is ongoing, the Peace and Security Council remains seized of the matter and keeps imposing in its communiques threats towards the unconstitutional government. And these threats include the possibility of imposition of stricter measures under Article 7G of its protocol. And here in Sudan, that what took place from the Peace and Security Council in order to verify what's going on in Sudan. With the transitional government, the Peace and Security Council decided to extend its deadline to give space more for the negotiations that are ongoing. Uh, and that extension was only for 15 days. However, the attempts so far at that stage didn't seem to bear through which confrontation between the military and the demonstrators took place, which led to some casualties. Hence, the Peace and Security Council enforced Article G on Sudan on June 6, 2019, by suspending it from the Union. The Peace and Security Council was no longer in a position to compromise for the fear of, of internal and regional escalation. This takes us to the third stage, which is intervention. Stage three at AU, crisis. Hence, if necessary, military intervention may be permitted as a last resort in the sanction regime. Here, intervention, as I mentioned, the sanctions are gradual. We started with the suspension from the activities of the union, and I will highlight, if you want, why it's important politically, this, this aspect. Um, but when we move from 
this type of like the basic sanction of uh, suspension from the activities of the union, we move to the second level of sanctions, which can be economic sanctions, can be transport, uh, closing borders, um, uh, like advising our government or requesting bilaterally that the governments will not will refrain from entering into cooperation with the under the intervention. Here I will, I will borrow an example from ECOWAS, which is one of the regional economic communities of the African Union. In the Gambia, uh, for example, and that is the community of West African countries, the former president Yahya Jameh refused to hand over power after losing elections on 1 December 2016. The AU Peace and Security Council called on him to step down. It was the same uh, context where the ECOWAS also called for him to step down and hand over power. But he refused to do so and took drastic measure, measures in order to remain in office. This put the country in political crisis and, of course, a threat of escalation into uh, civil war. So, in that instance, the Peace and Security Council of the African Union issued another communique on 17 January 2017, where it supported ECOWAS military intervention to return the country to constitution. Already ECOWAS had given permission to the troops of its countries to intervene in the Gambia in order to remove Yahya Jameh and give power to the or reinstate or instate the uh, democratically elected government. This took place. This took place upon a decision from ECOWAS without the shooting. However, the situation may escalate, commanded the action by ECOWAS, which was a military intervention. And this as well was later appreciated by the UN Security Council. And we will discuss when we are talking about the practice versus the law. Here we know that the law, basically, we need, as under Chapter 8, the prior authorization of the Security Council for any, any intervention. But we still have appreciation to our intervention without that prior authorization. So here, before I conclude on our AU measures, again, this is very important because it will come, I know, in the discussions. Do not forget that the African Union is a political organization and political considerations are part and parcel of any of its decisions. And that reminds us, of course, of the lengthy debates surrounding the recent actions the AU had taken in Chad after the assassination of President Debbie, and also the actions or the non-action in the case of Zimbabwe, when uh, the President Mugabe uh, was ousted. There are lots of circumstances surrounding the Peace and Security, decision, Security Council decisions not to initiate proceedings in certain cases. And I, I believe this, if you're interested more to address it, we can address it further in the Q&A session. Now, when I move to the UN, within the UN, the unconstitutional change of government is in no place found in the Charter, neither the matter of coup d'etat. Consequently, as I mentioned before, the UN Security Council does not intervene in such cases unless it constitutes a threat to peace and security as stated in Article 39 of the Charter. Moreover, to decide what measures shall be taken in accordance with Article 41 and 42 to maintain or restore international peace and security, as such will not allow the Security Council just to intervene just because it's unconstitutional change of government. We need to verify that what happened in a certain country, whether constitutional or unconstitutional, constitutes a threat to the maintenance of international peace and security. If not, then nothing will happen on the level of the Security Council. So 
if we have an unconstitutional government, it may pass very smoothly in the UN and the unlawful government may represent the country in the UN with no problems, but that would not be the case in the AU. So that is why the uh, issue of the unconstitutional change of government here, even when it comes to the text is different because we have it in the Constitutive Act very clearly saying we are condemning and rejecting the unconstitutional change of government, but that does not exist in the UN Charter. That is per the text. Again, per the text, and this is where we are talking about the theory, the UN Charter, Chapter 8, which allows the regional mechanisms and organizations to take action, including military, yet it is required to take prior authorization of the Security Council, yet in the Constitutive Act of the African Union, or even the Charter of ECOWAS, these founding documents of these organizations do not include, it is silent when it comes to the prior authorization of the Security Council. Of course, it can be debated that it is not mentioned or being silent does not mean it will go against it. Yet in practice, as we have seen that so far, in no case where we impose sanctions or we take uh, decisions to militarily intervene in one of the states in Africa, we don't take prior authorization per the UN Charter. And I believe this is like really debatable when it comes to the legal aspects of it and how it is. This is where for me it's like, and that is also one of the things that arise now we move to practice where the UN Security Council had never condemned the interventions or the sanctions taken by these government by, by these governmental organizations. It is accepted, commended, and appreciated by the UN. So now, for me, if we think about it, and I think it's uh, very important that to raise such question, whether this now, between the theory and the practice, constitutes a new norm that deviates from the letter of Chapter 8 of the UN Charter to leave the AU to act in Africa or ECOWAS to act in West Africa, or is it simple dismissal to such situations due to political balances at the UN Peace and Security Council? The Peace and Security Council of the UN has the primary role to maintain peace and security in the world. And regional organizations role should be complementary to the UN. Yet recently, there is a rise in the role of regional organizations in acting as guardians to peace and security in the regions, and they are taking over the role of the UN in their constituencies. The question now, does this erode the powers of the UN for the sake of the regional organizations like AU or ECOWAS? I believe this provides you with food for thought uh, to look into academically more in depth. I will stop here and looking forward to our discussion. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador, for really um, a very fascinating, uh, rich overview. And uh, I would say uh, extremely pertinent questions concerning one, the African Union, uh, the, co the, the constitutive uh, instrument and its relationship with the UN Charter. Um, on the question of um, the difference between the ability, of course, under the African uh, Charter to be able to intervene uh, in cases of unconstitutional changes of government. And I particularly appreciate that the unconstitutionality is not tied to violence necessarily. Um, and the last question you posed that perhaps we can follow up on that. Um, before I get to questions that we have from the q and I'm going to ask something because right it's really i your your this discussion is so relevant right now for the region here in asean because similar um asean itself was established 1967 
it has the Austin Charter, and I believe um, the current Austin Charter was adopted in 2008. And of course, one of the issues at the time was the question of what happens if there is military coup, uh, unconstitutional changes of government. Um, and so the presiding, the prevailing principle is non-interference. But as we know right now, we have a situation in Myanmar, um, which is really challenging for ASEAN because of this principle of non-intervention. Non um, nonetheless, it is, it is a challenge. And I, I ask this because if you could explain it, and I think this experience is quite relevant, how the African Union transformed, you went over that, but that's a big change to go from the non-interference interference, um, to the system you have now. And I'm just thinking what, I don't wanna say lessons, but what can be taken uh, from this experience for the ASEAN region? So I, I would, this is something that comes to my mind because it is right on point actually. And then Patricia may also have some questions and I know we have some in the Q and A, which we will get to. Um, shall we, uh, shall you I want also me to respond now or I shall yeah, wait? Well, uh, okay, uh, well, uh, yeah. if you want me to respond now, actually, this is one thing that I, that's why I mentioned the statistics. The, we have first, um, let, let me go a bit back in history when EU was established. EU was established mainly to create a from against colonization. So the perspective of African heads of states or liberation movements uh, and, and the member states, all of them, their perspective when they adopted the OAU charter was focused on one element is mainly the colonization of Africa. Yes, it, it complements many things. Like if we speak about human rights and good governance, for example, it's mentioned like it's a very, uh, like a, on a very thin line on the OAU, uh, in the OAU charter. It's different than we, when we speak about the AU. The difference in era differed when we moved to the AU. The Lomi Declaration was adopted under OAU because the number of cases of unconstitutional change of government that is taking place that are leading to escalations have been increasing. Now at that moment, most of Africa uh, or like 99% of Africa became independent. Hence, this comes with responsibility. The responsibility is showed that we ended up with a lot of coups. Forget about the political reasons why we end up with the coups now, but this is the situation. So, while sitting in a summit, all of a sudden, the representatives of one country became not representatives anymore. A head of state is not anymore a head of state and persistently insisting to join the meeting. So heads of state said no. And this is where the shift started. And that's why we changed the perspective, how it ended up developing in our system from OEU to AU, when AU was coming into life to inherit the OEU, was to change the perspective because we are not anymore colonized, but we are facing different challenges. And the different challenges started not because we have wars among ourselves. No, it's because within the same country now, the unconstitutional change of government or sometimes coup d'etat militarily leads to escalations, leads to civil wars. We have like a lot in, in the continent. So this needed to be tackled and that's how we ended up developing the situation. Maybe the, the, the difference between us and Asia that they, although there is the case of Myanmar, but they are not facing it as frequent as we are facing it. But like they faced it in one or two countries and so on. But a lot of their countries have established political systems that are followed, whether like uh, in Asia, we have like democracy, like in India or in Bangladesh, or we have uh, a different type of governance with still working very well and functioning in China. So the stability leads to mm. lack of movement mm. in the rules. Mm. But when you are 
witnessing a lot of instability in the region and we are aiming at trying to find African solutions for African problems. This led to the path where we ended up developing a lot of our rules to specifically face the unconstitutional change of government in order to minimize the threats to peace and security in the region. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a wonderful and insightful response. And I think that your point about stability is, is well taken. I see we have many questions, but let me, uh, before I get to those, Patricia, did you have uh, uh, any comments or questions you want to make while I look at these questions? Yes, thank you so much, Nilofer, and thank you so much, Ambassador Amira. This has really been a fascinating presentation. Um, it's uh, um, wonderful also to be hearing it from you, um, also as legal counsel um, of the African Union. And my question was, you mentioned in your presentation, of course, this is a political organization. These issues are mainly political, but I would be interested in, you know, in the measure that you can reveal it and explain it. Um, what kind of role does your office um, of the legal counsel also plays um, in this regard? Because, of course, there's certainly a legal dimension uh, to this and also link to that um, in how and what terms um, are the criteria for determining that a change of government is unconstitutional and how much of it it's from deriving from international law? How much does it derive from domestic law also? Um, if you look into that, I mean, I understand it's mainly the, the political and security council that would determine, but I don't know if there would be other organs that also input to, to that decision. And, and, and perhaps just as a last point, have there been disagreements um, if a cert certain situation is or not an unconstitutional change of government? That, that would be my question. And I see that the chat is piling up. So um, then we'll go, we'll go to the questions from the audience. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Actually, I will start by the bottom of, of my office. I, I didn't address it in my statement. Otherwise, I will speak for hours. Uh, so basically, um, it depends on the situation. Uh, whether we will be asked to furnish a legal opinion or not, or they ask for my presence. I think it's the same in the Security Council of the UN. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, um, it's a political and legal decision together. And why I mentioned it's a political organization, because I know the questions will be focused a lot on why did we do that and why we didn't do this, because I have witnessed that in many webinars. So that's why I had to remind everybody that we are a political organization at the end of the day. Um, and, and politics is part and parcel of the decisions. But that doesn't mean they do not depend on the law. Once, uh, of course, there are lawyers in the missions themselves of the member states. So they, they do the legal analysis based on our rules. Uh, in some instances, I am required to either furnish a legal opinion or to attend the meeting, which happened actually in the case of Chad recently. Uh, what happened in Chad led to uh, just in the same week directly to uh, a quick meeting by the Peace and Security Council where the issue was discussed. Um, I was requested to uh, provide a legal opinion on the matter. Uh, and to identify whether what took place after the assassination of President Debbie constitutes an unconstitutional change of government or not. So from my side, I provide the AU law and what is in the constitution of Chad. And I leave it to the member states to discuss it politically because I don't want to like uh, encroach on their mandate and, and be... Uh, like um, accused of being biased in a way or another. I'm originally a diplomat, so I know the difference. So uh, I, I draw the line and then I leave it to the member states to discuss. Um, it, within the discussion, while we are in session, sometimes they, they actually ask me some other legal questions and sometimes they are uh, maybe like legal questions, but they are still formatted in a political manner. So I have to make sure I'm only focused on the law and provide them with the rules. After what I, I provide, they take their own decision and they will decide whether it's like whatever I said falls under the circumstances, will they fall under 
unconstitutional change of government or something else. This is up to them and this is where they end up with decisions. In the case of Chad, it was a very heated debate because you're asking about the, um, like what I can reveal in relation to the changes of point of views. In the session, some member states decided that upon the rules and based on our rules in the AU, what took place in Chad is considered unconstitutional change of government. And they were insisting to uh, bring that in the communique. Yet others debated that we have to verify the situation first before deciding that it is unconstitutional change of government. So after a lengthy debate, we ended up with a decision from the Peace and Security Council to dispatch a mission to Chad to verify the situation. The mission is composed of some member states, some of the ambassadors representing the member states in the Peace and Security Council, together with members of the Secretariat. We have the Commissioner of Peace and Security. We have a member from the Office of the Legal Council and other members from the Commission that went together with the, with the team from member states. They met with the, the representatives of the military, they met with the representatives of uh, political parties, even the opposition, and they met with representatives of the youth, and they met also with, uh, which is the key element here, the speaker of the House of the Parliament, because he was supposed, in the case of the lacunae in the power, based on the constitution of Chad, to take over the power. And he's the one who said, I relinquished my uh, position per the constitution. I don't want to take it. The security situation in Chad is very volatile because of, as you know, the terrorism in the Sahel region. So the, he, in his own perspective, it is, he doesn't want to take that responsibility. And he prefers that the military takes over for, for this period of time to make sure there will not be escalations internally in Chad. The territory is big and terrorism is looming. So this is why he decided, I don't want to take it. So they put all of this in the reports. Of course, some of the opposition said the problem that the, there was no decision taken by the constitutional court based on the constitution to decide that there is a lacuna in power, then we go forward. So this is also another mishap when it comes to the internal procedure in accordance with the Chad constitution. All of these elements were put in the report, including how the previous president was assassinated. And the conclusion when it comes to the assassination, because also this is another key element, because whether the, the ones now in power had hand in the assassination or not, that should be also verified. So, so far, prima facie evidence that they don't have a hand in that uh, assassination. But yet, the conclusion of the report of the mission said there is, further investigation required to make sure what happened and the circumstances surrounding the assassination of President Debbie. And because of the mishaps in the constitution, they will not change the fact that the speaker of the parliament refused to take power. The lacunae ended up in the current military council taking power. And they put that in the report to the Peace and Security Council. Another debate took place in the council where it ended up with the conclusion, okay, based on what we have now from the fact-finding mission, that we cannot identify that there is unconstitutional change of government occurred because there is a lacuna of power in power and the outcome led to the ascension of the military council to power. So... They gave an ultimatum, they, they, they decided to give space to the military council because of the, like the situation of terrorism in Chad and in the Sahel, rather than escalating the situation, and requested 
the council to embark into again exactly like the Sudan case to get into uh, discussions in order to go for the uh, civilian government and they approved the time limit for the elections which was 18 months from that date so this is where we are. This is why I'm saying it has a legal aspect, it has a political aspect, and it has a factual aspect as well. And this is a very complicated case. Zimbabwe was the same. Zimbabwe, when the military removed Mugabe from power, they didn't move him completely because they still put him on paper that he is still the sitting president. And he showed himself in official functions as the president of the state. So having the discussions in the Peace and Security Council as well, led to the conclusion it is not uh, the military overtaking the power from Mugabe. Uh, it's just like because of this, later it changed, yes, but because of the circumstances, you cannot identify how we can say it's unconstitutional change of power. It's, this is where like again one thing that is coming up and in discussions in the AU and I think within the legal international community if there is a popular support to the government that overtaken power from a democratically elected government how can you deal with it how can you say is constitutional or unconstitutional the at the end of the day the constitution is there in place because it is expressing the will of states to have a constitution, to get, be governed by that constitution. So if we go back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the contract between the, the, the people in power and the, the, the people to be governed, like the social contract, simply, this is if we have a, a popular uprising saying we are denying all this and we are supporting the government that took like now took power how can you deal with that how how can you just say no we have to stick to that constitution if the people who actually approve that constitution say we don't want that constitution but they don't have any means to bring their voices up except taking to the streets so I think this is, again, another food for thought for us as international lawyers. It is something that really needs to, to, to be uh, thought of uh, like seriously. But also, at the end of the day, politics intervene because that is where we are, whether in the Security Council of the UN or in the AU Peace and Security Council. Because sometimes the decisions are uh, like put forward because of uh, a certain people who are representing certain regions in the Peace and Security Council. So you will find a very strong decision against one government and a very weak decision against another government. That is where when politics intervene. Uh, Ambassador Nagam, you're, you're, I have to say that you have demonstrated with such clarity the complexity of going from theory to practice. And <laughs> it's fascinating. It really is the challenges and and how to determine unconstitutionality, um, particularly the social contract that you reminded us of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So, but we have so many questions, I have to say. So let me, um, I will start off with um, a question. Were the African Union states that opposed the adoption of provisions relating to unconstitutional changes of government um, it has to do, how were these objections overcome? Was a decision rule a consensus rule or majority voting? So this is on procedural as well. Well, of course, like, um, let me start by how we take our decisions. Uh, our decisions are mainly consensus, but uh, in accordance with the, like all our rules, basically saying um, in, in matters of substance, if you fail to have consensus, we need two third majority. We can resor resort to voting, but we need two third majority for substantial decisions. From assembly onwards, like every, all the levels need, need this. Um, on procedural matters, if we don't have consensus, then when we resort to vote, it will be um, uh, like 50 plus one, 50% plus one. So simple majority, basically, not the two third majority. So this is how we take the decisions. Um, in the Peace and Security Council, 
Um, so far, decisions in relation to unconstitutional change of government are taken by consensus. Um, I was, um, but not it was not in relation to unconstitutional change of government. There was uh, this lengthy debate uh, in relation to the communique issued by the Peace and Security Council in relation to the um, uh, maritime border dispute between Somalia and Kenya. Um, and it was uh, lengthy discussed before, uh, like, while actually ICJ was in, um, is still considering the matter. Um, and, in, and I was asked, requested for a legal opinion and, and I was there in the session. And um, I recall the entire debate uh, led to one ambassador who was sitting in the meeting, received instructions from his head of state, certain language should not come in the community. And at the beginning, he refused completely to have a community. That led to a very lengthy debate because the council do not want to issue a decision with reservation because of course still they can issue the communique but the, this country will reserve its position which still weakens the 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 the, the, the communique so um the discussion kept on going and we started to play with the language i was asked again for uh, for an advice for a drafting exercise in relation to the language to the point, I don't know, I think maybe member states love my voice, so I had to uh, read myself the language, not the secretary to the council at the time. And um, at the end, although the ambassador had still to reserve his position, he said, okay, please give me time, I'll communicate with uh, my capital. So he communicated with his capital, and luckily, while we are in session, he received an okay for the new language. So the communique was issued by consensus and um, as a compromise, we played with the language. This is of course known in all international organizations, how we, we issue decisions uh, and resolutions. But the whole thing is the, the, the lack of consensus in the Peace and Security Council may put us at limbo. But uh, to an extent, I don't know how, but as I just gave you an example, we always end up with uh, such decisions and uh, the maximum will be uh, consensus minus one you know in a, in accordance with the uh, now uh, as known in the practice of international organizations uh, consensus doesn't mean unanimity so uh, if uh, one country reserved its position decisions can still go on by consensus while we have a reservation of one country this is the situation but usually peace and security council in, in these uh, circumstances and unconstitutional change of government, they end up taking consensus decisions, uh, whether the, the countries that reserve their positions were in the debate um, like it or not, but at the end, they join the consensus. They give up and they join the consensus. <laughs> Wearing them down. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, I'm going to continue because we have more questions for you. Um, here we have, um, thanking you for a very thought-provoking intervention. So it's a long question, but let me see if I break it down. First, what is the role of sub-regional organizations in this overall scheme? Basically, um, whether prior to the intervention of the African Union, is their first attempt by the sub-regional organizations, such as ECOWAS, or is there a coordination mechanism? between the AU and the regional mechanisms. And second, specifically um, looking at recent examples such as Mali, uh, would you say that the AU course of action for such cases, namely suspension, is efficient? All right, um, I will start by the, the RECs, the regional economic communities like ECOWAS. Um, we have a coordination mechanism in peace and security between the organizations like the AU as a mother organization and our regional economic communities. Recently, to enhance such coordination, we have a new protocol that has been adopted on the level of the heads of states and about to be signed between the executives of Rex on enhancing the cooperation between the AU and Rex, which is an amended protocol. There was a protocol before, but now we realized we need more coordination. So that is when it comes to the legal aspects of it. In terms of peace and security, for example, especially because it leads to the issue of the unconstitutional change of government and any intervention, 
it's there is always uh, liaisoning between the two organizations or, or us and all the eight recs and we have represented those to the recs in AU. So they come and they bring uh, to our attention anything in relation to their work uh, and RECs. So this is one of the issues that when we are talking about uh, whether there is an intervention or um, anything in relation to their work in peace and security aspects, we have coordination. Of course, this coordination does not stop at peace and security or unconstitutional change of government. We have this intervention in, uh, uh, sorry, this coordination and collaboration in trade matters, in, in, in uh, free movement of persons and so on. Because for example, now we have the CFTA on the continental level and all of our RECs have another trade uh, agreement uh, in relation to uh, the free trade among them. And there is a provision in the CFTA addressing the uh, collaboration and the different rules in the within the regional the sub-regional organizations and the AU. So this collaboration exists. If we are speaking about the issue of AU, ECOWAS, and Mali, let me clarify something. Sometimes the sub-regional organizations are faster than the regional organizations. The regional organizations are faster than the UN. This is by virtue of the size and by virtue of the political interest and importance uh, of the issue and the context, of course. So sometimes ECOWAS moves faster than the, EU, the AU, like what happened in Gambia. That's a very clear example. They, they issued decisions faster than the AU because they are solely West African countries and it is an issue within their region they know it very well. Gambia is a very small country surrounded by very big countries like Nigeria or Senegal. So it's easy to, to move faster and intervene faster there. If you go to the other aspect in relation to AU and UN, we have the same thing. AU is faster to act within Afri Africa as a continent because it's all Africans versus having um, Asians, Europeans, uh, Americas in the, in the meeting because the political interests will differ. Um, uh, legal concepts may differ. So that is why in some cases we are faster to act. That again should not uh, make us forget that the main principal organization to maintain peace and security around the world is the UN, it's not us. We should complement them, not the other way around. While now, that's why I said food for thought, to raise the issue where now we intervene faster than them. So now it is something that we have to ponder upon whether in a way or another, we are taking over the, that principal role, which is not supposed to be ours. And also it costs a lot when it comes to finances and we face more hurdles than the UN. If we are speaking about this, and if we are talking about um, the AU and Mali, for example, and the suspension, I mentioned the suspension very quickly, but I didn't, I, I, I said, if you want, I can embark on um, identifying why it is very important to the states, the suspension of the AU. Let's start with the political aspect. Politically, when a government is suspended from its representation in uh, a governmental organization, uh, it weakens its position internally because then you will, you will be in isolation. If organizations start one by one, freezing your participation in its meetings. That is number one. Number two, which is very important, that it might affect your interests. Here, let me go back to the Sudan case. When Sudan was suspended, Sudan has uh, Amazon. It has uh, the, the Darfur um, um, African Union troops. Um, it has like missions in different parts of Sudan. So now, if it is suspended from the union, it cannot participate in the meetings discussing its case. And this happened in the Sudan when the extension of uh, Darfur mission was discussed in the Peace and Security Council while Sudan was suspended. So Sudan was not allowed to sit in the meeting while it's the host country to the mission. 
and you cannot have this discussion without those countries. So how can Sudan uh, bring its position onwards to the Peace and Security Council? It was done through us, the commission as secretariat. So they had to liaise that position, whether to uh, uh, ask for the extension or not, through the secretariat of the Peace and Security Council. This is not something at any point in time aimable to governments. They like the diplomats to be there to defend what they want. But when you put it in writing, you don't have anybody to defend you because the secretariat will just bring what, your memo to the attention of the Peace and Security Council. But you are not there in the debate. So this is one of the flaws. The second, which is very important, is in relation to assuming the positions in the international organizations, because we have a mechanism within the AU to coordinate the candidacy of Africa in the UN system and other international organizations. So if there are elections for positions you want to go for, or your candidates had already been adopted by the executive council, which is the house of our foreign ministers, you will not be able to get Africa support. We had this again in uh, Sudan case because they had uh, a Sudanese national on uh, IOM director position and also in the ECAO for their uh, representation there. So we had elections upcoming, we had appointments upcoming in the international system where we had Sudanese nationals and Sudan was under sanctions. So, and there was no new executive council meeting in session to change the candidates. So I was even asked to furnish legal opinions what we can do, whether to maintain the Sudanese uh, candidates, whether we um, just have a lacuna and then leave it open to all African states, um, whether we have enough time to bring the issue to the attention of the executive council in order to either confirm its decision or bring uh, another candidate uh, from another country to take over the position that we have. So of course the situation differs that like my legal opinion had to have some practice here that if we don't have time, if we are going to lose the seat, then let's continue with supporting Sudan because the decision was adopted before the decision of the Executive Council. And participating in meetings of the UN is not an activity of the African Union. It's an activity of the UN. So we cannot say yes or no to that. But if we have more time and we have an Executive Council session that will come, then we have to bring to its attention the situation. And then they will decide whether to keep supporting the candidate or not. The other issue internally as well, the suspension bans the government from submitting any candidate within our system. So they lose if they want to, uh, like now, if we have, for example, uh, positions in the African Union Commission, they cannot present candidates. They cannot present candidates to any of our organs. So again here, they lose. They lose their presence in the organization and in the decision-making mechanism of the organization. So it affects their presence in our organs as well. So this is another aspect where the suspension from the activities affect the government. Of course, when it comes to developmental aspects as well, if we have uh, meetings, of course, like we have a lot of now programs in agriculture, in trade, in industry, in uh, airspace, name it. So all of these programs, if the country it was part of the activities, if they were already there, the, the continuation of the program will still be ongoing. But if there are meetings of coordination between the AU, the states that are recipient of the uh, program and the donor countries, they will not be allowed to sit in the meetings. So that's another bad aspect for them, which will affect them economically. The other one, if we are now getting a new grant, for example, for a new project, 
they will be excluded. Let's say we are speaking about the East African region or in Mali, the West African region, then Mali will, be, uh, will not be subject to the program. They will not benefit from it. So this is another issue that affects the development in the countries as well, deriving from the suspension of the activities of the UN. Thank you. Oh, wow, There's, uh, this is really, I have to say, I'm learning so much. Uh, and again, I keep thinking about uh, ASEAN and the whole debate going on about Myanmar and suspension. Um, so I really think that there's much to be looked at within the African Union experience. We're actually going over a little bit of our time, but would you have time for perhaps another one or two questions? Sure. Fantastic. This really, I have to say, this is a wonderful uh, session we're having with you. Uh, I'm going to read out two. They're short, and you can either answer both or pick one. Um, one has to do with Libya and the African Union's recognition of the transitional council in Libya. Um, and the questioner says it uh, questions this that um, that the tr transitional council in Libya took the power unconstitutionally and basically asking how the African Union came to this recognition. And the second one I think is also interesting about, um, have you noticed a real impact of AU UCG decision uh, in a, on coup, coup d'etats in Africa since its inception? So has it had an impact? That's how I read that. Okay, the first one is Libya. Libya is a very complicated situation that is now uh, like um, a sore uh, wound uh, within Africa. Um, and uh, it is the situation in Libya and the lack of security in Libya and the lack of stability in Libya is leading to a lot of escalations in the region. Because, for example, at least in my country, I know some weapons are coming through Libya illegally. Uh, and that, uh, like, of course, it goes into the hands of terrorists. So it affects us in other areas, like in Sinai or parts of Sinai, where we are still fighting terrorism. Now, if you go to, um, like, the, the, because let me be very clear Libya is 2 million square meters, it's huge. The territory is huge. It has very long borders and they are all desert. And the desert there, even the sand is not the stable sand. It changes because of the wind. That is the Great Sahara. So it's so difficult to control. Now, if you think of this huge territory and the number of terrorists that are actually coming from outside of Libya, they are not Libyans. They are mercenaries fighting in Libya. I can identify the countries. I can tell you everything about it. They are one of our neighbors, so I know a lot about their history and everything. So I studied in my books when I was a child. So anyways, these huge borders lead to movement of terrorists and equipment that are used by terrorists. This is affecting the Sahel region. Libya borders... A lot of these countries, like Chad, like uh, uh, other parts of uh, like Mali, like all of these countries that are bordering Libya from its southern borders are affected by this terrorism. So we have terrorism in Mali, we have it in Niger, we have in uh, in Chad, and we have in Burkina Faso. Regardless of the distance between them, border-wise, but the situation in Libya and the loose security on the borders, the southern borders of Libya, <coughs> is absolutely affecting uh, this region. Of course, I spoke about um, uh, my country, which is Egypt, but if I speak also on Tunisia and Algeria, they will be facing the same thing. So this is very crucial because the mercenaries that are coming in, they, are, they can easily pay the nomads in the desert that know the routes better than any army. And I can assure you, the routes of the deserts are known by the nomads of the desert much better than any regular army in the world, even if you have the best uh, satellites. Because with the moving sand and the seasons when the sands are moving, 
it's only the people living there that, the, that move with their camels will know how to go through these deserts. So this is where the situation in Libya is very serious. And a part, of course, from the migration to the north, because that was one of the major routes for the illegal migration on unsafe boats uh, in the Mediterranean, where it, it needed the guards, the coastal guards of Italy, to be in the middle of the high seas in order to prevent these unsafe boats to go. It leads to the loss of lives of Africans. It's simple, as simple as that. So accepting different situations in Libya is number one political before any rules because the situation there merits this. And here I will wear my diplomatic hat rather than my legal hat. And I will tell you, if I am sitting in the position where I will take a decision for Libya, I will look into the real politics today. What is the situation? How I can remedy the situation politically? And I will even disregard rules for it. Because whatever will bring stability in Libya will bring stability in the region. So it's important for us to look into any remedy to the situation. We have kept saying this situation will not be sorted out except politically. Militarily, it will not be sorted out. So if I can now have a movement on the political sphere in Libya that may lead to anywhere stability in Libya, we will be supporting it. And that's why African Union supported it. I personally will support it. So this is when it comes to Libya. Um, the other question uh, is in relation, I think it was in relation to Mali, right? And uh, the was, other question, yeah, the other question had to do with um, um, the question about whether um, the AU uh, unconstitutional change of government has had an impact on coup d'etats, and it gave um, Mali an example. Yes, actually, um, again, Mali is very a very difficult example because if you can um, look into the recent history of Mali, you have you will see it has been suspended return, suspended return. It's not the first or the second time even to be suspended. Um, the, the, the problem um, in the Sahel region specifically where we are facing a lot of challenges is terrorism. And terrorism is leading to a lot of coup d'etats. We have, of course, like we, we cannot deny there are external powers playing in the region. It's not only the Africans that uh, can decide on this. Um, and they are not, not only the Africans are on the ground, there are many others on the ground. So if you have many forces on the ground, you cannot uh, just say, okay, um, your measures is sufficient or insufficient because there are much bigger powers playing there. But um, to an extent, I would say at least it plays as a deterrent and it makes governments think twice uh, and it pushes them to put civilians around. We have seen that in Sudan because in Sudan, if we didn't have the process within the African Union of suspension and then um, the attempt to return while Sudan has so many interests with us, as I mentioned, because of the peacekeeping operations ongoing, it ended up with a compromise from the military council to have a civilian component in place and to look forward to have elections. Without these efforts and without these suspensions and without this, these rules, we wouldn't have seen them. It's simple. Why would the military council leave power? They have the, the military might and uh, people in power how they are, whether they will kill the civilians or not, whether they will uh, imprison civilians or not. So it, it is as simple as that. If we do not have this kind of political pressure derived from our rules and the government itself knowingly, it will affect not only its legitimacy, but also it will affect its real presence in the international sphere. And it might escalate internally because of the peace uh, op keeping operations there. They wouldn't take any further action to uh, legitimize the situation. 
So I would say it is to an extent effective. It is not an ideal world, and these are not ideal rules, but at least it worked to a certain extent as a deterrent and as also an incentive for the unlawful governments to constitutionalize their situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and um, I think we really have come to the end. We've gone over time, but may I say that uh, this has been such uh, an, an incredibly illuminating and rich a discussion. Um, and you have really so masterfully uh, and with great clarity explained to us, not just legal issues, but the political reality. And you underline that, but I think that's so important. Um, and I really feel that we've just touched the surface. <laughs> I would love to go on and on, to be quite honest. And, and I can't think it's very few people have the depth of knowledge you have about, you know, the Afri uh, the, you know, the African system, the AU, the different countries, the complexities of all the political moving parts. This is a very complicated continent. Um, so we're so fortunate to have had you. I'm so grateful. And I do hope we can have you back because <laughs> I'd love Absolutely. to have part two of this wonderful discussion. Uh, so I thank all the participants who joined us. And, um, and, um, and, and I, at this point, perhaps I give the floor now to my dear colleague, uh, Professor Galvo Tellis, who also probably has some final words to say. Well, just uh, to echo what uh, Nil Perez said, Ambassador Amir, it's really been a pleasure. I think we do need another session to continue these discussions. And it's very interesting, the African Union uh, experience is unique in a certain way, but at the same time, very interesting uh, for also other regions, including, including Asia. And um, it's, um, it's a real pleasure and an honor to have somebody who has hands-on on this case this is legal counsel of the uh, African Union and who can share from her direct experience and your very important role um, uh, these examples and also make us think about uh, uh, this uh, this important legal but also political issues and I do also appreciate very much the interest that um, uh, this has generated also in our participants that ask very good questions and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all and we thank look forward to <laughs> we look forward to seeing everyone again at our next Distinguished Series uh, speaker event. And until then, wishing everyone stay well, stay safe, uh, and take care. <laughs> Thank bye you bye. so much. Hope next time it will be physical. <laughs> I hope so Thank too. Thank you very much. <laughs> One